Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, and we welcome you back to another jam-packed episode of The New World Next Week. And everything you need is at NewWorldNextWeek.com. Links, sources, high-quality, low-quality video, and so much more. James, let's begin this episode with the wide-view geopolitical story that we'll take from The Independent. As the devastating dossier on abuse by U.K. forces in Iraq goes to the International Criminal Court. A devastating 250-page dossier detailing allegations of beatings, electrocution, mock executions, and sexual assault has been presented to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and could result in some of Britain's leading defense figures facing prosecution for systematic war crimes. General Sir Peter Wall, the head of the British Army, former Defense Secretary Jeff Hoon, and former Defense Minister Adam Ingram are among those named in the report entitled The Responsibility of UK Officials for War Crimes Involving Systematic Detainee Abuse in Iraq from 2003 to 2008. The damning dossier draws on cases for more than 400 Iraqis representing, quote, thousands of allegations of mistreatment amounting to war crimes of torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. They range from the disgusting laundry list, hooding prisoners, burning, electric shocks, threats to kill, cultural and religious humiliation. Other forms of abuse include sexual assault, mock executions, threats of rape, death, torture, etc. The formal complaint to the ICC lodged yesterday is the culmination of several years' work by public interest lawyers and the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, ECCHR. It calls for an investigation into the alleged war crimes under Article 15 of the Rome Statute. The dossier, seen by the Independent and James, unless you know more than I do on this, there's not a copy of this floating around. I looked for it. It's the most detailed ever submitted to the ICC's Office of the Prosecutor on War Crimes allegedly committed by British forces in Iraq. The court has already acknowledged that there was little doubt that war crimes were were committed. James. Absolutely. Well, I haven't seen the dossier itself either, but hopefully that will emerge so people can uh, take a look at it. But at any rate, this is it. The gauntlet is down. And for anyone whose minds are still trapped in the matrix, this is a chance for them to snap out of it and to watch this process at work as the ICC will eventually, inevitably put these charges to bed and not do anything about them. Or there will be some sort of mock show type of trial that will uh, ultimately devolve perhaps down to the UK government and end up trying a few uh, low-lying generals or or what have you and completely obfuscate the absolute criminal uh, responsibility of the the politicians who who fostered the environment which made this possible. And for people who go and read this full report at The Independent, it will be quite clear that this is something that was fostered by the uh, the top-level brass and uh, the top-level politicians, and it was something that went on for years. And again, I'm sure most of the people watching this broadcast don't need to be told that. I think they already understood that serious war crimes have been committed, of course, by the UK uh, government uh, officials who were in charge of this, as the US officials, of course, in charge of uh, of their troops as well. Um, One of the startling things about this uh, particular article for me was uh, that, in fact, the, the, the court, the ICC, has already admitted that the war crimes have taken place, but they declined to prosecute them before because there was a lack of a uh, of, of, of number of incidents um, for them to, to consider hearing the case. So reading from the article, it says the court has already acknowledged that there was little doubt that war crimes were committed. In 2006, it concluded there was a reasonable basis to believe that crimes within the jurisdiction of the ICC had been committed, namely willful killing and inhuman treatment. At that time, prosecutors cited the low number of cases fewer than 20 as a reason for not mounting an investigation. So yes, war crimes were committed, but we're not going to try them. There's only, there was only a a dozen or so. Now here's this dossier uh, compiling all of these extra charges and extra uh, incidents. So really the gauntlet is down and the the ball is in the ICC's court. I am not holding my breath. I do not think this is going to end up with uh, Tony Blair in the gallows, but, uh, but again, hey, I'd love to be proven wrong. And uh, it, when, and if I am, I'll, I'll be happy to eat my hat. And when and if I'm not, I hope the people who are st- 
still uh, caught in that matrix and believe that somehow the UN and the ICC and all of these institutions are going to be the saviors of humanity will perhaps eat their hat and realize that this is a completely 100% show trial system that's designed, as uh, the report goes on to say, is designed to try Africans in Africa, basically. That's all the ICC has done so far. James, I'll sneak in one related note before we move to our second story, and that is, of course, speaking of war criminals, Ariel Sharon is dead. Having said that, we'll move to our second story this week via the New American as the CFR Dream Team sweeps the Fed. The rumors have been confirmed. Obama's plan to name Stanley Fisher as vice chairman of the Federal Reserve was made official last week, January 10th. At the same time he announced Fisher's appointment, the president also named Lael Brainerd and Jerome Powell to positions as governors on the seven-member Federal Reserve Board. Fed Chairman, new Fed Chairman, James, which we have not really spoken about here on New World Next Week, new Federal Reserve Chairperson Janet Yellen and Vice Chairman Fisher also serve as governors. Unremarked in any of the media coverage of these appointments is the significant fact that all four of these Obama nominations to one of the most powerful institutions on the planet are not only members, but high-level operatives of the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR, the premier U.S. think tank that has been promoting world government for the past century. Federal Reserve Board Governor Daniel Tarullo is also a CFR member, and as the New American reported December 29, 2013, Stanley Fisher was named this past September to be a distinguished fellow in residence at Pratt House, the CFR's New York City headquarters. In that same article, the New American noted that many additional CFR members and officers have rotated in and out of top positions at the Fed, Treasury, and big Wall Street firms such as former Fed Chairman Paul Volcker and Alan Greenspan, as well as current Federal Reserve Regional Bank Presidents William Dudley out of New York City, Dennis P. Lockhart out of Atlanta, Georgia, Richard W. Fisher out of Dallas, Texas, and current Federal Reserve Board of Governor members Daniel K. Tarullo, Jerome H. Powell, and Janet Yellen. This curious Pratt House influence extends back over the past century to the, as we just noted a few weeks ago, the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve, to such top Wall Street insiders as Paul Warburg, who is the chief architect of and propagandist for the Federal Reserve Act and one of the founding directors of the Council on Foreign Relations. Back to the present day, in his announcement of the fisher Brainerd powell nominations, President Barry Satoro stated, quote, These three distinguished individuals have the proven experience, judgment, and deep knowledge of the financial system to serve at the Federal Reserve during this important time for our economy, end quote, James. So the takeaway on this is that the CFR doesn't just stand for the Council on Foreign Relations. It stands for the Council of Federal Reserve. Absolutely. Well, we always encourage people to take a look at the articles, and I hope that they will go and read this article because uh, that's a lot of information to take in there, and it goes into a lot of depth about those connections and the Federal Reserve and the, the Council on Foreign Relations being intertwined since both of the uh, the foundings of both of these institutions back in that uh, in that heady period in, around the, f the First World War. And uh, doing my own research for the, uh, the the Federal Reserve documentary that I'm working on, it, it absolutely is apparent to me the, the absolute nexus that exists between the Federal Reserve, the banking community, um, and eventually the founding of the United Nations and the, sort of the internationalists in that in that uh, sphere. So uh, it is a nexus there that, that persists to this day, that has persisted for the century of the lifespan of the Federal Reserve, that, that creature that won't die. And uh, so this is absolutely important for people to understand that. And just to add, you know, another element into the mix, I guess they were trying to cover all their bases. Stanley Fisher is not only the Distinguished fellow in residence at the uh, Pratt House of the CFR, but also um, not only a U.S. Israeli dual citizen, but in fact the former uh, governor of the Bank of Israel. Um, in another one of these bizarre moves where the international banking oligarchy is unmasking itself for the international um, group that they are with no allegiance to any country whatsoever. We saw Mark Carney going over from the Bank of Canada to the Bank of England last year in a bizarre move. Now we've got Stanley Fisher moving over from the Bank of Israel to take uh, the Fed. Vice Fed chairmanship, um, 
again, just a, a, a really bizarre move. And also, he's he's also the person who supervised the PhD thesis of Ben Bernanke and uh, and another high ranking Fed official. So um, uh, just I mean, just craziness going on here. And it to my mind, this brings back the idea that it's always the second in command that you want to be taking a look at in these big institutions because often the f- the first person is just the puppet they put out front. But just like uh, Cheney in the Bush White House, or just like uh, I'm in Al Zawahiri in Al Qaeda back in the days when Osama bin Laden was the front puppet. Um, It's always the the second in command who seems to be the one who's really pulling the strings. So I'm going to have my eyes on Stanley Fisher as well as Janet Yellen going into this new Fed chairmanship. And uh, well, at any rate, it should be interesting. And once again, I'll just ask people to hold off on uh, as I'm working on this feature length Federal Reserve documentary. It is going to take a while to get out there, but I think it'll be worth it in the end. Absolutely. I, I know. I'm excited for it. James, I'll mention one economic-related note before we move to our third and final story this week. People not in labor force soars to a record 91.8 million. That would be the lowest participation rate in this whole game we call an economy since 1978, James. So having said that and speaking about economies and something that's integral to its economy, but also seems tied in this sort of suicide pact to death, that would be my home state's relationship with coal. So those of you probably don't need any reminder, as it's been one of the largest stories going on in the country over the last week, massive, if in effect, if not in reach, chemical spill in West Virginia, hundreds and hundreds of thousands without water. You've followed the story Let's get a little bit of an update that this comes today, James, as er earlier, January 15th. As spill fallout continues, Freedom Industries cited at a second West Virginia site. And we'll take this from KSDK. The company whose spill contaminated the water supply for 300,000 West Virginians has been cited for violations at a second facility where it's storing chemicals. Department of Environmental Protection spokesman Tom Alois said inspectors found five violations Monday at a nitro site where Freedom Industries moved its coal cleaning chemicals after last Thursday's spill. Inspectors found that, like the Charleston facility where the leak originated, the nitro site lacked appropriate secondary containment. In Charleston, a porous containment wall allowed the chemical to ooze into the Elk River. Alois said Wednesday that the state might force Freedom to relocate the material again. The nitro facility isn't near a river or a water supply, but other violations include failing to follow stormwater and groundwater guidelines, not filing or filling monitoring reports, and not properly storing drums with potential contaminants. James, to break this down, they made a mess, so they had to move all their crap to another spot That's also making a mess. And the state's saying, well, we might make you move it to another third place where you'll continue to spread this mess. Now, James, another update to this story that, that again, is just kind of coming out today and take it from the Charleston Gazette out of West Virginia. Influx of ER visits reported following lifted do not use advisories. Area emergency rooms are seeing an influx of patients reporting symptoms related to exposure to chemical tainted water despite the fact that West Virginia American water has deemed the water in many areas safe to use. Dr. Raul Gupta, health officer for the Canal Charleston Health Department, said 101 patients visited area emergency rooms in the 36-hour span ending 7 a.m. Wednesday morning. They reported symptoms related to tainted water. I think all I can say, James, is, is this reminds me of three words, Christy Todd Whitman. The air is safe to breathe. The water is safe to breathe. Don't worry about it. Pay no attention. Just go right back to it, James. Yeah, it's uh, sad how relevant that uh, that one lie continues to be as it reverberates around through to today. And we, we have to be reminded of that from time to time. Yes, your government will lie directly to your face, even if it means your potential death. Um, just another, unfortunately, terrible uh, situation for the people of West Virginia. I know you have a lot of family and friends still out there. Have you got any personal experiences or, or uh, heard anything that from the personal side that you can share? I had not firsthand, but there, yeah, definitely have friends who were without water for, for several days who live. I mean, Char- Charleston's the capital. It's the biggest city in West Virginia. So when you take away water from the capital, and that's kind of the main hub, that's where government is. That's where other industry obviously is. And that's where just regular folks are working, have not had water. 
the flip side to that, an hour away where, uh, where I'm from, where my parents still live, I think everything's A-OK and it's a different, different waterway. So the contamination has not won't go there. That's the most that, that I know. But again, it's just that <laughs> I wish my home state could be in the news for something other than a horrific environmental catastrophe. But what are you going to do? It, it continues to live up to the uh, media monarchy tag of uh, West Virginia worries, doesn't it? Yeah, that's sad. And it's just another reminder that disaster, whether man-made or natural, can strike at any time. And you could be without water or food or shelter or what have you, electricity. And the question, is, as always, is are you prepared? Do you know what to do in those situations? And on that very note, for people who uh, whose answer might be no, uh, I direct them over to the uh, Tragedy and Hope YouTube channel where they're amassing some playlists on self-reliance, how to start a fire, how to make a, a make shift uh, tent or, or what have you so so some uh, some just practical skills that people can actually use and once again I mean this this information is at our fingertips let's be using it for something practical just in case you know the lights go out or what have you mm -hmm. James uh, just in closing I'll, I'll note one thanks to Sam at pirate printing company for the t-shirt and for folks out there also to continue to submit stories on Twitter using hashtag new world next week you can follow me at Media Monarchy. You can follow him at Corporate Report, James. All right, let's leave it there. James, thank you again. Looking forward to next week. All right, man. Thank you. Take care.